Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Kimia Karimi. I'm a PhD candidate at NC State University. And uh, our research is about uh, assessing the effectiveness of uh, stormwater management practices on controlling um, nutrient loading using uh, Bayesian watershed modeling. As many of you may know, um, excessive nutrient loading is the major cause of water quality problems, uh, such as hypoxia. Uh, nutrient loading is constant, constantly changing over the time scale of uh, decades due to changes in precipitation, uh, land use, and different management practices. Uh, however, um, uh, the problem is that uh, most of the modeling efforts um, only rely on uh, consider variability over a small uh, number of years using a relatively simple or manual calibration. Uh, here we present a novel approach using multiple uh, decades of uh, data and Bayesian statistics to um, uh, provide systematic data-driven um, uh, inference of key loading and retention rates. Uh, in specific, uh, specifically, we try to answer the following research questions. First of all, we try to characterize the nutrient loading from different sources, and we try to compare uh, the export from urbanized lands with non-urbanized lands like uh, agriculture and undeveloped lands. And also, we uh, account for the effect of precipitation on uh, nutrient uh, loading, as well as the effect of uh, uh, vegetated stream buffers and stormwater control measures. And finally, the percentage of uh, retention um, uh, in our study area or the percentage of export that is reaching the uh, downstream reservoirs. Uh, our study area is, um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you see my cursor, um, is the Falls Lake and Jordan Lake basins. We divided the Jordan Lake into two sub-basins, uh, the New Hope Creek and the Haw River sub-basin, and uh, we delineated the watersheds based on the load monitoring sites. Uh, these load monitoring sites had at least five years of daily flow data and also um, uh, 50 uh, water quality samples at least. Uh, we included the land use data um, using the uh, Envolt rasters. And here this map shows uh, general land uses, uh, the undeveloped urban and agriculture, and also the growth in, in the urban area over uh, from uh, 1974 uh, through 2012. You can see the increase in the urbanized um, areas uh, upstream of the Falls Lake, also uh, in the city boundaries of uh, Durham. Uh, we also included uh, new uh, geospatial representations of uh, buffer coverage. Uh, this map right here uh, shows the regions that drain to streams uh, through vegetated buffers. Uh, the gray area, which is mostly uh, within the uh, boundaries of the city of Durham, doesn't have um, uh, vegetated buffer, but the purple and the yellow colors on the map uh, shows, uh, show the changes in the vegetated buffer status, and the green color shows uh, the areas that are vegetated in both the beginning and the end of uh, study period. And uh, for the buffers, we considered 15 meter buffers on both sides of the streams. And uh, for the buffer to be considered uh, vegetated, we um, um, set a threshold for 70% uh, uh, undeveloped land for it to be considered uh, vegetated. Uh, we also included uh, uh, stormwater management practices uh, to assess the effective effectiveness of uh, stormwater control measures. Uh, we defined the areas requiring management practices uh, using the uh, NCDEQ post-construction post stormwater data. Uh, there are various programs uh, with uh, different uh, starting dates in our study area. Um, like the water supply watershed uh, that started in 1992 in, um, in the large portions of uh, Falls Lake and also later into 2012 in some portions of um, Har River uh, subbasins. Uh, there are also uh, NPDES related programs in the Har River starting in the 2000s. These programs require installing uh, stormwater control measures such as wet, wet ponds for high density developments and uh, for the low density developments, they uh, instead uh, require to limit their um, uh, built upon area, maximize disperse, dispersed flow, and ensure uh, vegetated conveyance. 
so uh, we mostly had uh, the uh, program starting date available, but for those um, areas that we didn't have any um, effective dates available, we used aerial imagery and um, NC1 map uh, building footprints, or we contacted the local stormwater departments. Uh, and we assumed that the new urbanizations occurring after the program starting date to have, um, uh, to have stormwater control measures. Uh, uh, for our uh, modeling uh, framework, we used uh, prior knowledge from previous, day, uh, previous uh, research, and we uh, also uh, included multi-decadal data sets such as the land uses, the buffers and stormwater control measures, and uh, as well as uh, precipitation and livestock. And uh, we incorporated them, uh, incorporate um, uh, mechanistic processes to calculate uh, loads, and we calibrated uh, the model in a Bayesian framework uh, to match with the observed loads. Uh, the parameters, which are uh, mostly export and uh, related to export race and retention race, are then estimated uh, probabilistically. Uh, so we will have a um, probability distribution for the parameters, and we will update our knowledge uh, using this Bayesian framework. And we can use this um, key loading and retention rates for um, uh, forecasting uh, future scenarios. Um, so uh, we develop models for both total phosphorus and total nitrogen. I'm just presenting for brevity. I'm just presenting the results for uh, phosphorus. Um, so this plot, this violin plot, can actually answer um, uh, one or two of our research questions. First of all, uh, we can see um, the um, export from different land uses, and we can compare uh, the we can compare them. You can see the highest export is coming from uh, urbanized areas, especially the untreated portion. The next highest export is coming from agriculture, especially the unbuffered portion. And then uh, the lowest, uh, the lowest export is coming off from the undeveloped, uh, mostly forested lands. You can also see the effect of uh, stormwater management practices. Uh, you can see the effect of buffers, stormwater, stormwater control measures, and uh, also the combined effect of buffers and stormwater control measures, which is um, reducing the export uh, consider considerably. Uh, we also uh, see that the model uh, can. Um, uh, um, reduce the uncertainty around the parameters. Uh, so this, um, uh, these lines here show the uh, standard deviations of the priors and the posteriors. The standard deviation of the posteriors is much uh, smaller uh, than the prior standard deviation. Uh, so we use nonlinear relationship for precipitation, uh, looking at the inferred relationship between loading and precipitation. Uh, we find that the agriculture is highly responsive to changing precipitation, as you can see this high slope in agriculture, while uh, urbanized sources are more constant sources. Uh, this is because um, agriculture needs um, um, higher rates of precipitation to mobilize, mobilize nutrients. However, uh, urbanized sources um, can uh, export with a uh, lower amount of uh, precipitation as well. You can also see, uh, again, higher amount of export from untreated urbanized lands. However, for uh, higher precipitation rates, the agriculture uh, becomes the dominant source. Uh, the source apportionment throughout the study period, again, showed the um, uh, interannual variability due to precipitation. Uh, here, um, uh, you, can see, you can also see the trend in the area from 1994 to 2017. This is, we've chosen, uh, we've chosen this, uh, this time period because uh, we didn't have point sources uh, prior to 1994. Uh, so um, the area of the uh, urbanized land that are that have stormwater control measures are um, and buffers are increasing through time, and you can see um, that the export is also in, uh, from these lands are also in, uh, increasing from 1994 to 2017. We can uh, see the same trend of uh, interannual variability in the other uh, sub basins. However. Um, uh, for like uh, the New Hope Creek, you can see less interannual variability because it has a lower amount of agricultural land and a higher amount of urbanized lands. Whereas for the Har River, we have a much uh, higher agricultural lands. 
And if we map the export by subwatershed, we can define the uh, areas that are hotspots for uh, diffuse nutrient export. Uh, in our study area, these um, these are the subwatersheds that are located within the older city ba um, city boundaries, like uh, the Greensboro, the Burlington, and Bur uh, Durham. Uh, this, this is because um, most of these cities didn't have um, uh, buffers or stormwater control measures back in like 1980s or uh, 1990s. Uh, and then um, we also calculated uh, a nutrient retention uh, within uh, streams and water bodies uh, throughout uh, our study area prior to reaching uh, uh, Falls Lake and Jordan Lake. Uh, we found uh, the retention was uh, greatest in the subwatersheds that were uh, upstream of uh, large um, impoundments that they that had like long residence times. Uh, so, to some of our finding, uh, we um, um, uh, so we were surprised to see like the differences between uh, different uh, land use export, especially uh, compare, comparing undeveloped lands with the um, unmanaged urban lands showed us that we, uh, the export from the, uh, the, these lands were about an order of magnitude less. So it was uh, specifically for, for uh, total phosphorus, it was 94% less and for nitrogen, uh, it was 91% less uh, than the unmanaged urban lands. Uh, we also um, um, saw that the and uh, found that the agricultural lands exported less nutrients than urbanized lands, except under high precipitation years. Uh, this happened for both TP and TN. Uh, we uh, found that both as uh, stormwater control measures and vegetated stream buffers are doing the job that they are supposed to. They are um, uh, effectively reducing the uh, nutrient loading. Uh, the combined effects of uh, stormwater control measures and vegetated stream buffers uh, reduce 70% of TP loading and 64% of TN loading. And finally, um, we found that the majority of nutrient export is reaching to the downstream lakes. Uh, the retention for TP was around 30% uh, on average, and uh, for TN, it was 20%. Uh, uh, we also developed two um, uh, simple future scenarios for, um, uh, for our study area. The first scenario, uh, is, which is a like, hypothetical future scenario, is uh, a 20% increase in the urbanized uh, lands across all subwatersheds, uh, assuming that uh, no stormwater management practices uh, are implemented are implemented. Uh, so this uh, future scenario yielded a 9.3% um, increase in the overall loading on average, uh, and with the highest uh, increase in the subwatersheds that are uh, within um, like um, urbanized uh, areas like um, uh, Greensboro, Burlington, and Durham. Uh, we had another scenario, a 20% increase in uh, the urbanized areas um, that assuming that buffers and stormwater control measures are required for all new developments. And uh, this um, uh, scenario yielded much less uh, increase in the uh, uh, export. It had a 2.7 increase on average uh, in our study area with again higher um, increase in the um, subwatersheds uh, in the uh, within the um, uh, urbanized areas older urbanized areas and um yeah that's all uh, i think thank you for your attention and i will be happy to answer the questions all right we have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any questions please come up to the microphone here if you have any questions online, please put your questions in the Q&A. Well, I don't see any questions online. Looks like everybody here is pretty satisfied. So thank you very much for your presentation. Sure. All right, we can go ahead and get started. So our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Perskayevich from UNC Greensboro, and she will be discussing uh, fog interception in spruce fir forests in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 
Thank you. Good morning. So in order to understand what fog interception is, it helps to look at the water budget for a forest. So what are the potential pathways that water can take through a vegetation canopy? So the main input of water is precipitation. Um, some of that precipitation may make its way all the way directly to the ground where it can either evaporate, infiltrate into the soil or generate surface runoff. Um, however, because there's the presence of vegetation, some of the precipitation is going to collect on the surfaces um, of the trees, which is known as interception. So uh, some of that intercepted water will eventually make its way to the ground via through fall, which is water that drips off of the leaves and branches, or uh, stem flow, which is water that flows down the tree trunk. Uh, but some of the intercepted water is going to evaporate before it ever has the chance to make it to the ground. So for that reason, uh, we consider rainfall interception to be a loss from the perspective of the watershed because this is water that otherwise would have been available for stream flow and soil moisture that is lost uh, from the watershed because of the presence of the vegetation. Fog interception, however, is a different story because fog represents an additional input of water into the watershed. So fog, of course, is just a cloud with its base at or near the ground. It consists of tiny water droplets that are too small and too light to fall to the ground as rain. However, those suspended water droplets, when they encounter vegetation surfaces, can collect on those surfaces, um, therefore representing that additional input of water into the watershed, uh, independent of precipitation. Um, and just like with intercepted rainfall, some of the intercepted fog water will evaporate before it makes its way to the ground, but some of it will make its way to the ground via through fall and stem flow. So uh, we consider fog interception to be a potential gain of water to the watershed. This is water that is available for stream flow and soil moisture that would not be if the vegetation were not there to intercept the fog. So there are particular environments where fog interception makes up a significant proportion of the water balance. Um, so this includes uh, the famous tropical cloud forest that you get in places like uh, Costa Rica. Uh, it includes coastal deserts like the Atacama Desert in uh, Chile, where there's almost no rainfall, but there is frequent fog due to the presence of a, of a uh, cold ocean current. So the vegetation that lives in that environment gets almost all of its water from fog. And then it, an example of a temperate cloud forest would be the redwoods of the California coast, where there's little precipitation during the growing season, but abundant fog that helps to support uh, the redwood trees. So uh, there's another uh, environment uh, in our region in which fog interception is uh, likely to be a significant component of the water budget. Um, and that is the, the Southern Appalachians. So um, in particular, I'm focusing on Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So uh, the Smokies are a notoriously foggy place. They're called the Smokies because of the frequent fog and humidity that hangs over the peaks resembling smoke. Um, so there's uh, several different fog mechanisms. There's frequent radiation fog, which occurs on the valley bottoms most mornings. Uh, when the ground cools off and cools a layer of, of air above it to saturation. There's also frequent orographic fog when uh, moist air is blown up the slopes of the mountain uh, and reaches saturation. Uh, if you look at the fog climatology of the US, uh, the Southern Appalachians stand out as being one of several areas with high fog frequency at an annual time scale. Um, however, where the, the Southern Appalachians really stick out is when you look at uh, the number of fog days per month in the summer. Uh, it's unusual in that uh, there's actually a, a highest fog frequency in the summer in the Southern Appalachians, as opposed to most other fog hotspots in the US that get higher winter fog frequency. Um, and the reason for that is the, the prevalence of uh, maritime tropical air masses that affect the southeast in the winter. So these very moist air masses, when they're forced to rise over the mountains, it doesn't take much cooling for them to reach saturation and generate fog. Um, so that's kind of interesting from the perspective of fog interception because it's during the growing season when um, the, these fog interception events are likely to be most common. So uh, the specific environment of the Smokies that we're looking at for fog interception are the spruce fir forests that are found in the highest elevations of the park above about 1700 meters in elevation. 
Uh, these forests are a relic of the last ice age. So during colder climates, um, spruce and fir trees, uh, forest types that you would now find somewhere like Canada were widespread throughout the Southeast. And as the climate warmed, um, they were uh, replaced by hardwoods in all but the, the highest um, and coolest uh, mountain areas. So the two dominant species here are red spruce and Fraser fir. Uh, this is a highly endangered ecosystem. Uh, the main threat is uh, an invasive insect, the balsam woolly adelgid that kills Fraser fir trees. That also leaves uh, spruce trees more vulnerable to wind throw due to gaps in the canopy created by the dead firs. Uh, both species are also highly sensitive to air pollution and acid rain. And there's a concern that as the climate is warming, um, that the uh, hardwood species that are the next vegetation zone down may be moving to higher ele elevations and ultimately displacing spruce and fir. So there has been some previous research indicating that fog interception is a major component of the water balance in the Southern Appalachians. Um, so this 1982 paper by Smathers used uh, fog interceptors. So basically put rain gauges out in the open to measure rainfall and then um, above some rain, gauge, rain gauges also included a screen that collects fog and then the water drips down into the rain gauge th so you can measure the additional amount that is contributed by fog. Um, so in some of these um, sites, uh, the, the total amount of water inputs almost double when you consider uh, fog interception as an additional input of water. Uh, but what the, a previous study like this doesn't show is whether there are differences between different tree species in their ability to um, intercept fog water. So what we're looking at here is how fog interception differs between um, spruce and fir versus northern hardwood species uh, in the Smokies. Uh, the sort of motivation for this is thinking about how the vegetation water balance might change if there ends up being widespread encroachment of hardwoods into the spruce fir zone as a result of warming temperatures. Um, and then kind of the flip side of that is can this additional water that's provided by fog interception, uh, provide a buffer for spruce and fir against um, warmer and drier conditions that may result from climate change. So uh, we had three study sites um, in the spruce fir zone um, of the Smokies. So the highest elevation site um, above 2000 meters is Klingman's Dome, which is entirely within the spruce fir zone. And then we had two um, lower elevation sites at Mount Collins and the Nolan Divide Experimental Watershed, um, both of which are right around the sort of transition zone uh, between the northern hardwoods and spruce fir. So had a mixture of both forest types. So uh, we set up a total of nine rain gauges across the three sites. At each of the sites, we had an open site that is measuring just rainfall. And then we put a, a six additional rain gauges beneath the canopy of individual trees um, of different species. Um, so we put two under fir, two under spruce, and two under yellow birch, which was our representative hardwood species. Uh, all of the uh, gauges within a site were within um, a couple uh, hundred meters from each other, so we can assume the microclimatic characteristics are similar. Um, and we had the gauges in place uh, from May to November. So uh, in order to use this method to estimate fog interception, we can consider the inputs and outputs from each of these different gauges. For the open site gauge, all that's going in is rainfall and all that's being lost is evapotranspiration, which we can assume to be minimal because the gauges are designed to minimize evaporative losses. For the beneath canopy gauges, we may get inputs of direct um, rainfall. Again, we're losing ET and we're also not capturing stem flow, um, but uh, we are capturing uh, rainfall through fall. Um, so any rain that has fallen and collected on the canopy and then is dripping into the gauges as well as any potential fog interception uh, gain through fall. So any fog that is intercepted and then drips into the gauge. So in order to differentiate between the rainfall through fall and the fog interception gain, we look for water inputs into the beneath canopy gauges when it is not raining. So we know that it is not uh, direct rainfall and has not rained recently, which allows us to control for rainfall through fall. Um, and this is possible because the gauges we used are electronic recording tipping bucket rain gauges that have a very high temporal resolution, so they can record at frequencies as high as one minute. So when we look at the total water inputs into the different um, 
gauges, we can see a couple of uh, things. So this is over the entire May to November time period. Um, there's a couple of big peaks of um, around five inches at some of the gauges, which are uh, tropical storms, Fred and Ida, respectively. Um, I also want to note that there were um, uh, equipment failures at two of the Mount Collins gauges that resulted in several weeks of missing data. So those were not included in the, um, the total uh, amounts here. Um, so when we look at the, uh, the total amounts, um, we can compare the amount of uh, rainfall, which is what is being recorded at the open sites, um, to what is being received at the beneath canopy gauges. Um, and so again, we can't do this comparison for all the sites because of the, the missing data at the Mount Collins site. But when we look at uh, Clingman's Dome and Nolan Divide, we can see that um, there's always um, higher uh, water inputs at the open site gauges than at the beneath canopy gauges, which makes sense. Uh, that indicates that there's net uh, rainfall interception loss at the different gauges. And those interception losses uh, range from 11% for um, uh, a fir uh, specimen up to 57% for a spruce. Uh, but in order to look at the fog interception, we have to uh, look at the timing of the water inputs into the gauges. Uh, so um, doing this, uh, we used a threshold of three hours um, since precipitation uh, to isolate the rainfall through fall from the fog interception events. So uh, anytime that there's water going into the gauge when it is not currently raining, according to the open site gauge, um, and has not rained in the last three hours, uh, we flag that as a potential uh, fog interception event. So uh, the total number of fog interception events range from uh, 47 to 82 over the study period. Uh, there seemed to be somewhat higher frequency at Klingman's Dome, which is the highest elevation site, and therefore we would expect to have the highest fog frequency. Um, and then um, the total amount of fog interception, when we just sum all the inputs uh, during those potential interception events, range from 24 to um, 116 uh, millimeters. Uh, we haven't yet done uh, statistical analysis on these results, so these are preliminary. Um, what we're in the process of doing now is verifying whether these potential events are actual fog interception events. Um, so to do this, we are using the webcam at Klingman's Dome Summit um, and looking at the times that were identified as potential fog interception events. So again, when there's water going into a beneath canopy gauge, when it's not raining and has not rained recently, and just looking at the webcam um, when these events occur during daylight hours and saying, okay, is it foggy or not? Um, so out of the, the 31 events that, that um, we had webcam images for, um, there were only four that had like clear conditions and were definitely erroneous in terms of being fog interception events. Uh, the remainder were either um, kind of marginal where um, there's potentially some humidity or moisture in the air where fog interception could be occurring or um, were obviously foggy in that you would be very disappointed if you climbed uh, Klingman's Dome that day and saw that view. Um, so overall, um, we had over 80% um, of our potential events being uh, confirmed or, or um, supported by the webcam images. So when we look at the verified um, events, uh, we can compare the uh, fog uh, interception gain across the different species and sites. Um, so uh, when we, we do that, um, so this is the, the additional amount of precipitation relative to uh, sorry, the additional amount of water inputs relative to rainfall um, that are contributed by these fog interception events. Um, it's lowest for birch at Nolan Divide with only 2%, and then um, fir and spruce at Klingman's Dome are 4 and 6%, uh, respectively. Uh, there's much higher amounts at Mount Collins, so ranging from 21 to 23% for the different species, but this is likely a data quality issue. Mount Collins was the one that had missing data. Um, and even though we excluded the periods of missing data from the calculation of the fog interception gain, uh, the period where data was missing was like August, September, which is when we had those big tropical systems. Um, 
So it's likely that the total amount of rainfall is underestimated at Mount Collins, and therefore the fog interception appears higher relative to rainfall than it really is. So overall, uh, we were able to um, identify 87% of um, the events for which we had webcam images available as conditions that were either clearly or potentially favorable for fog interception. So that gives us some confidence that this method uh, can be successfully used to identify fog interception gain. Um, our amounts of fog interception gain range from 2% to 23% with the higher end of that likely to be an overestimate. Um, it's notable that these are much lower than um, the estimates of 86 to 94 percent that were found in that earlier paper for the Southern Appalachians. Uh, the likely reason for that is a difference in methods. So that earlier paper um, was just uh, collecting uh, the fog on a screen that then dripped immediately down into the rain gauges. Uh, we believe our method more adequately accounts for canopy storage uh, because it's beneath the, the uh, vegetation canopy. And so it's also accounting for evaporative losses from the canopy before it gets into the gauge. So it's a sort of more comprehensive assessment of uh, the water balance um, in the watershed. Um, and we haven't yet done the statistical analysis to determine whether these interspecific differences really do exist. Um, so uh, we're going to be looking uh, more at that to see if there truly is a lower uh, fog interception uh, for the birch compared to the, the spruce and fir. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge Friends of Great Smoky Mountains National Park for funding, um, the National Park Service and the University of Tennessee Knoxville for fieldwork access and logistics and a crew of field assistants that ranged from an undergrad student uh, through grad students all the way to a retired professor, all of whom helped out in the field. And I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, so we have about three minutes. If anybody has any questions? Um, also, if you're online, go ahead and feel free to put questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I'm just curious why you chose three hours and if you looked at any kind of sensitivity analysis or anything with respect to that. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we chose three hours because um, so the the software, this is like the the rain gate rain wise um, electronic recording rain gauges. It uses three hours as a threshold to identify like what is a rainfall event. So basically, from the time the bucket starts moving um, to when it like stops moving, that's a rainfall event. And like when it stops moving for for three hours, then it's like okay, that rainfall event is over, and then it would start recruit recording a new event. So um, it's based on you know kind of just that being an easy like characteristic to extract from uh, the data files that we have. Uh, but we are uh, working on our own um, R code to uh, analyze like the raw data so that we can experiment with with different thresholds because yeah that could obviously be one of the things that's ident that's um, uh, influencing the identification of these fog interception events and like some of those cases where it's like clear skies, uh, but it's still saying that there's fog interception. This could be one of the explanations for that, that it rained a few hours ago, and now there's still water dripping into the gauge. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, like with climate, are these areas, do you think, getting foggier, less foggy, or has anyone, have you thought of that at all? Yeah, we thought of that. Yeah, so um, it's it's kind of important for the, the assessment of the significance of the results, because if it turns out that um, this, this fog interception water is important for the spruce and fir for continuing to provide moisture if conditions get like hotter and drier. Um, that would only be the case that it could act as a buffer against climate change if then like the fog frequency is unchanged in the future. And of course, if everything else is changing, it's likely that the, the fog um, will change as well. Um, so yeah, it's like um, kind of like contradictory in that there's, you know, with warmer uh, temperatures, you have a higher saturation vapor pressure, but then of course we also get um, higher water vapor concentrations uh, as a result of climate change. So like which of those two kind of wins out and, you know, affects the, the fog frequency, that would be like a really key uh, characteristic in assessing uh, what the, the changes in fog frequency in the future are. So. Yeah, that would be something separate to look at. All right, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you.